Hey everyone, welcome to a live interview on Digital Nomad Ventures. Today, I'm honored to be doing an interview with him. He is co-founder of Remote, Remote Portugal, Remote Europe, Future of Work Conferences, and Remote Work Movement Podcast. He's also the creator of the Digital Nomad Village in Punta del Sol, Madeira. So without further ado, let's welcome Gun Hall to the show. Good morning. Welcome, Gun Hall. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon for you, sir. How are you doing? It's a pretty good. Coming to you live from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Where are you? I'm in Valencia, Spain. I came here for the month just to chill out a little bit. It sounds exotic. So you're <laughs> not, not that much if you are Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> so you spend a little bit of time between Portugal and Spain when you want to relax? To uh, well, yeah, because I have most of my projects are in Portugal or around the coast, uh, I decided to take a month vacations, meaning a month without leaving any community and just chilling out and actually working more. Uh, so I decided to come to Valencia because I have a big friend here who had an empty and I said, hey, Gonzalo, do you know any digital nomad who would like to stay in Valencia for August? I was like, well, I know one at least. And so that's how I came to Valencia. It was destiny. <laughs> Amazing. I've been telling myself I want to make it down to Portugal at some point, but it's proven to be a little bit difficult because I'm not vaccinated yet. Uh, but hopefully soon. Yeah, that'll be soon. Early next year. Yeah, yeah. Man, come. It'll so, be amazing. Awesome. I've been following your work for, gosh, over a year now. And I think it's great what you're doing with the, <laughs> the Digital Nomad Village in the Madeira Islands. Obviously, you've been getting a lot of press. You've been featured in the CNN, Washington Post. Where else? You name it. Uh, Lonely Planet. Yeah, Many different, pretty much uh, everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to start off the interview and just ask you, like, what inspired you to launch an innovative digital nomad village on the Madeira Islands of all places? Obviously, there's a lot of options out there. Why did you choose yeah. Madeira Islands? Well, that part of Madeira shows me. So I actually wrote the project three years ago. Uh, when I was in Erasmus Plus project in Italy with the team Intra Rural Ship, so entrepreneurship in rural uh, areas. And I wrote the whole project there. We should create a digital nomad village to attract first digital nomads and then to attract population in order to repopulate abandoned village, which is a huge issue here in Europe. And well, nobody ever took the project. Somehow I went to Madeira to organize a conference. Conference, the future of work conferences that you mentioned invited uh -huh. the government and i saw how crazy beautiful madera is man I, I i love bali i love thailand and still madera completely blew my mind on how beautiful it is it looks it's beautiful from the pictures that i've seen mm -hmm. insane so i was saying to the uh, minister of economy this place is insane how come nobody in the, in the community knows about this Come on, what the hell are you doing? What I are have you a project, thinking? Let's work. Uh -huh. And the guy looked at me, yeah, the guy looked at me very serious and said, Tomorrow he needs to speak with Miguel. I'm like, okay, I had a conference going on, I, I kept going. So by lunchtime, uh, Carlos from Startup Madara told me that Miguel is actually the president of Madara. Mm -hmm. So in the next day, I was speaking with the president of Madara about the project, and everybody loved the project. So they decided to wow. invest and implement it in Madara. So Madara shows me. <laughs> so you've been working actively with the governments in Portugal to make this a reality. It seems like a massive undertaking. Uh, yeah, I've been trying. So Madara was that brought light to my work or to this possibility and since mm -hmm. then a lot of things are happening both in portugal with now caparica near lisbon but also the first country in africa i'm working with cabo verde which is super exciting and it's the first project like this in africa so i'm also very excited Congratulations. About that. even though thank you so much even though it's in, in, it's in the same region right it's madeira canary island south of the canary islands is cabo verde in, yeah uh, but it's completely different vibes completely but still, I yeah, was, I was actually with all these communities. Awesome. I was actually just talking to Patty. She's the uh, manager at the Yellow co-working space here in Chiang Mai. And Ooh, she yeah. mentioned the Canary yeah. Islands. I think she was living there for a couple of years because she's from a very small country near France. I forget the name of the place. Uh, it's like an uh, independent nation state. Okay. Very, very small, small population. But yeah, um, 
That's interesting. Nice. I love. So, I was five months in the Canary Islands. I love it. So anybody out there, Canary Islands, I don't work with them, but I'm a big friend of Nachos and he's doing an amazing work for way longer than I'm working on this. Oh, great. Now, Nacho Rodriguez? Yes, he's, yeah. he's a superstar in terms of all this. Awesome. Yeah, I'm connected with him, but I haven't actually met him yet. Um, but yeah, so next question is like, what advice do you have for traditional employees who still feel confined to the cubicle, they're like stuck in the status quo mindset. How do they break free of that? I think the first is misconception already happening? we are seeing, mm -hmm. yeah, com first completely, like 50% of the people we had in Madari in the first five months of the year were new nomads, people that started now because their job allowed them to work remotely. So if you work in the computer and somehow you are not working remotely, what the hell? It's a thousand. Yeah, years. what are you thinking? It's just <laughs> the ship is sailing. The ship is sailing, man. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you, you can either adapt to the change or be left behind, and that's what happened okay. with the companies uh, for sure. And we can tell about that. But on the only side is just there is thousands and thousands of right now. If mm -hmm. your employee, if, you, if you, he wants to go back to the office, he will lose at least twenty five percent of the employees. Uh, at least I'm I'm lowering down because sixty percent of the employees want to work remotely in the future. So if yeah. your company doesn't want, they are a little bit fucked, to be honest. And a lot of, but, a lot of these companies, so go. Mm -hmm. a lot of yeah, these tech yeah, companies yeah. are encouraging, <laughs> they're offering pay raises, right? Yeah. It's to incentivize yeah, yeah. remote workers to yeah. not come back to the office. So just try out the place next to you. So if you're in Europe, Come to Madeira, go to Lisbon, go to something. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say go to Lisbon, even though I'm from Lisbon. I'd go to go to something small, like Bansko, like Malaga, like Madeira, like Canary Islands, Las Palmas. So you could understand in a comfortable place for you because it's still your culture. Mm -hmm. uh, how it is to be a digital nomad and buy tickets somewhere else. Go to Playa del Carmen in Mexico. Go to Bali. Go whatever you want. But try it out call home so that if things go wrong, you are two, three hours wide from home. So that would be my biggest advice. And always start with the community. When you go to a place where there is already digital nomads like Chiang Mai, that changes everything. And sure. the experience that people in Madara had was incredible. People came for a month and stayed for five. Wow. I was actually living in Koh Samui for about five months, which is an island in the southern part of Thailand. And it was an amazing experience. You, obviously, the beaches are completely empty because there's no foreign tourists here. And yeah, it did. but the thing is, they don't have any co-working spaces in Costa Mui. So I have a friend who's actively working to make that. Ooh. It's just coffee shops. Um, otherwise, you have to go to Copenhagen. They have a few co-working spaces over there. But Ooh. yeah, I think a better option would be the Madeira Islands. <laughs> So yeah, next question. Well, I was in Kasamui two years sure. ago. Same. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you are a little bit late. So I was yeah, there two years ago, there. and I felt the same. Uh -huh. I love everything, but there is no. I just need a coordinating space to be happy there. And that's all I need. Yeah, sure. Don't get me wrong; it's beautiful, beautiful island, and they have a lot to offer. But they definitely need a, a, a co-working space there soon. Just one. It all starts with one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do it. So next question is, what makes you so passionate about the digital nomad lifestyle? Whew. So I I was always a nomad in my life. Uh, so I, mm -hmm. I think I born a nomad somehow because when I was a kid, I was moving from school to school. When I was traveling, I always thought, hmm, it should be cool to live here. I would love to yeah. try to live here. And this was always my mindset, or even before I knew what the hell a digital nomad was. So for me, it just suits my personality. I'm a yeah, NTP, I'm an entrepreneur, and just out one day in Madeira, now in Valencia, next in Chiang Mai, this really brings the creativity and helps me learn about the world, understand the world, and to be honest, the community is amazing, and I learned some other people in this community, because I, like my Bali, we're discussing global tech strategies, and now my dinners are discussing uh, cryptos, and how can mm -hmm. we do social tokens for a new company I'm having, so it's completely crazy how much their knowledge there is in the community. And because everybody's different, everybody sure. is out of the status quo that you mentioned before, it becomes that it's like they are they were chosen, or most of them were chosen because they have this very special mindset that connects with yours. 
So suddenly you are in the middle of experts. You are going to the beach. You are playing beach volleyball. You are having dinner with experts in their fields. And the amount of knowledge you can have with that is incredible. So it's just all that. It's just an amazing community. For me, it suits my, my personality perfectly because I get bored in places after six months. So yeah, it's perfect for me, this mm -hmm. life. <laughs> yep, yep. I was starting to get a little bit bored in Koh Samui after five months. And then I decided to come here to Chiang Mai. And now uh, it's actually difficult to leave Chiang Mai because there's no flights in or out of the city and no, no trains, buses. Uh, it's very hard to get back to Bangkok to go somewhere else. So for the time being, this is my home base, for better or worse. And could be worse. Yeah, it could be worse, for sure. I'm living here with my girlfriend, <laughs> renting Airbnbs a week at a time. They have some co-working spaces here. So it's not so bad. Really nice ones. But, I heard about a really yeah. cool new co-working space. I went to visit 80%. I was there before. 80% uh -huh. is because of this, because they are they, they imitated Bali. I'm very curious to see if they nailed it or not. A few of them have had to close down. There's one, a Draper Startup House. You may have heard of it. They have a yeah, site here in like Austin, it. Texas, a few other places. They had to close their doors Ooh. because there's just there's no customers. It's very unfortunate. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we shall persevere, right? Man, for me, that's, uh, that's why I stayed in Europe as well. It's because mm -hmm. Europe, with all the bad things we have here, it's a little bit more stable and we, can, we know what to expect. Yep. It's not perfect, think, far from that. It's it's chaos. It's a mess. But still, you know more or less what. I think you I think you made the right decision there because in Thailand we have an authoritarian government, and they're just locked down the entire country. Uh, it's, yeah, it's not easy to travel around. Yeah, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> so my question is: next question is average cost of living and length of stay on the islands in Portugal. What do you say? So Madeira, the cost of living, it, it can be a lot, right? So it can go from 1,000 euros or 800 euros to 1,000. 1,000 euros is like to live okay, to average spending is 1.8 thousand euros. Yeah. Uh, 1.8 can get you a really nice lifestyle already. You rent a car for yourself. A car usually costs around 400 euros a month. That costs around 800 euros a month, and you can buy uh -huh. food. So, for example, lunch uh, is eight euros, everything included. Uh, wow. For dinner, is a little bit more expensive, like 12, 15 euros. 15 euros is the average to go out for dinner. Eight euros is the average if you go out for lunch. The co-working in Madari is free, uh, oh, paid amazing. by the government, which is really cool. And that's mm -hmm. it. So, with 1.8, you get you have a good life. With yeah. 1,000 euros, we had one living cheaply at 1,000 euros. They share the house. If you share the house, it stays like 400 euros a bedroom, more or less. So it's super affordable. And for 400 euros, you can live in the very nice house, huge with everything included oh. already. So you can That's go from, with, with yeah. roommates or just by yourself, you can get... No, no, sharing a house with 400 euros, yeah. Okay, okay. Sharing a house. Uh, and... An apartment goes from 100, you can have a full apartment for you. Wow, that's not bad at all. I would say it's comparable no, to here in Thailand. Wow, I'm renting a whole village. I'm renting a whole villa this year for 1.6. And it's a four bedroom villa with pool, with gym and everything. So it's quite okay. Incredible. And and for our listeners here, you can easily make uh, a booking at an accommodation through the website Startup Madeira, right? Does it made possible? Uh, so Startup Madeira is like an aggregator. Yeah. So we, for most of the things, we partner with Flatayo. The guys and Mike's were very helpful since the beginning because it's very it's very hard to centralize everything that the guys allowed to do this. So Flatayo was essential, and I'm the X with Dave as well. Uh, but you see several houses already in the website, and the, the whole process is you go to the website, you register. Everything is free. We don't charge you for anything. Just to receive an email from Michaela, our amazing. Receive an email from Michaela. There is a Slack link, so we have a Slack community that is like it has like four thousand people now, for everybody who is in Madeira. And then on the Slack community, there is this channel for accommodation. We do share the accommodation as well. So there is a channel for asking all the questions about Madeira for sports, everything you need. Yeah. It's on Slack basically. So that's how the process goes. And you come. There is somebody waiting for you. We have a community, an active community manager in. Every single community, because now we have more community. We have Ponte do Sol, 
We have Funchal, the main city. And we have Machipi, so four communities that are active right in Porto Santo, the small island, will be active in October. And you just come. And we make sure that it's as easy as possible for them. Awesome. And you also, ho I was watching another interview with you on YouTube as well, and I understand that you also host regular uh, events where you can go play volleyball, Dude, do some diving, it's, yoga. It's, it's insane. We started with one, two events a day in the beginning in February. <laughs> right now, well, it's summer, so it's a little bit lower. But by June, we had eight, nine events per day. It was insane. I don't wow. know where all the events came from. And it's not mm -hmm. as it's not as organizing everything. We just put together and we empower people to organize the events. It's just nomads organizing stuff for nomads. So imagine you, Mike, go there and share your knowledge about everything you want to know, or everything you want to share your knowledge because you love the community. Myself, I organize the event because I love the community. If I know acro events about Akroyoka, if I love dancing, I'm organizing events about dancing. So every single day a week, we had eight, nine events per day, like in May and June. Yeah. Just in Ponta do Sol, events of Mashiku, there's the events of Funchal. If you get everything together, we organize- They all come together and converge into one. Wow. Yeah. Sounds it's like insane. a digital nomad <laughs> paradise. <laughs> During COVID, and, and we respect COVID yeah. rules as much as we can. So after COVID, this will explode because we don't yeah. organize parties. Uh, we don't organize several things that we could organize without COVID. So do you after still have COVID, to wear a mask too? Like, even though most people are uh, back, wearing a mask? Uh, it's a mix. So inside, you always have to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. uh, outside, it depends on how many people are around you. So it's most state right now. Yeah. Uh, so if there is nobody around you, even the police will not go yeah, after you. But if you are in a place with more people, imagine in a main street, you are you should wear a mask. So it's more like a mindful uh, sure. experience instead of uh, everybody has to wear a mask. We are transitioning to a state where you need to wear a mask, but you need to be mindful mm -hmm. where you need to wear a mask and you don't need to wear a mask. Here in Thailand, they actually, they have a 20,000 baht fine if you're caught not wearing a mask. I don't think it's strictly enforced, Jeez. but, you know. Better yeah. safe than sorry. If you go into a public place, better just to wear a mask. But exactly, that's my thoughts. <laughs> uh, but no, so, next question is: uh, What's the visa process and tax system like in Portugal? I understand that you already have a digital nomad Ooh. visa. Mm, so that's much. not true. Unfortunately, I would love you to be right, but you, yeah. not quite. So, we have a we have a visa for a while. That most digital nomads, the digital nomad visa, it's the D7 visa, which is actually a passive income visa. What most oh, really? lawyers can do with that D7 visa is that they can say, because you don't work for any Portuguese company, that your work outside Portugal is kind of passive income from Portugal. So that's how they go around that idea. That's and they, yeah, so the passive income visa became a digital nomad visa, non officially. I'm to push the government and I'm, I have a lot of people pressuring the government to release something at least just to a little bit more adjusted. So in the, just instead of passive income, your income and will be more or less the same, uh, but just any kind of imagine if it's profits from intra that could or should all count. But yeah, that this seven visa is very easy. We have the non habitual resident uh, scheme, which is also very easy to get just come okay. basically. And just for our listeners, maybe and not familiar with pass, passive income, what qualifies as passive income? Well, an income that you have, for example, mm -hmm. yeah, imagine affiliates. If you have, uh, if you advise products from Amazon, you receive a small percentage. You are not yeah. actively doing that every day. Imagine you do a beautiful video like this one, and I say, you should buy this. And I put the link in the comments, and then you go buy, and I have done nothing, and I'm getting money from Amazon. So uh, the same with investment, investing, and you have dividends coming every year, you are expensive income. So basically anything not related with your direct work, it's something that you can uh -huh. plant and then it, it grows by itself, hopefully. It's a dream if, of digital nomads. Yeah, of course. There's, there's so many, and of course, there's so many different affiliate programs out there. It's been easy. I've actually, I've, you know, I was making money through the Airbnb referral program for many, about two, Ooh. three years, getting new hosts to sign up. Yeah. And I've been trying to do that more lately, but it's due to COVID and everything. It's more a little more difficult. Oh yeah. But um, well, yeah, it's, it's finishing in Europe. Money. So 
back, Do back, it for back Europe. in South America and just making money through the Airbnb mm. referral program. That's great. smart. So man. what if That's you're what if you're renting an Airbnb in Portugal, say on Madeira Islands? Would that qualify as passive income or do you have to pay taxes on that? No, I have to pay taxes on that. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of because course. For, for, for several reasons. First, it's in it's in Portugal. Then you once you buy property, once you have a flag in Portugal, you have to pay tax mm -hmm. in Portugal. That uh, makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, of the D seven doesn't force you to do that, but yeah. But then there is like there is a lot of ways. I'm not not a lawyer or accountant, but there's a lot of ways that the lawyers can go around and if you're in America, you don't pay taxes because you avoid double taxation. But if you're in the state that doesn't mm -hmm. tax you, so Portugal will not tax you. So it says, so there's a lot of loopholes that lawyers a, that partner with us working with our clients. As a U.S. citizen, would I be required to pay taxes in the U.S. and Portugal? No, that we, uh, that we have a deal to mm -hmm. avoid double taxation. And that's, that's what great. I was saying. So if you're in Texas, for example, you don't have to pay taxes in Texas. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to pay taxes because we think that you pay taxes in your own country and we avoid double taxation. So I'm not a lawyer. Again, don't take my word. Yeah, but yeah. This is the angles that our lawyers were having with the clients and they were doing a great job before we really have it. Great. That's very good to know for future reference. If I do decide to come to Portugal or for our listeners too that want to come to the Madeira Islands. And yes, and we don't tax uh, crypto. We don't tax anything related with crypto. Really? So it's even if you put it back into fiat, if it goes back into your bank account, it's not tax taxed. So at, until now, mm -hmm. things can change. But so far, we are very crypto friendly. There is like Lisbon is a huge has a huge crypto community. Even in Badada, we had a big crypto community. We organized an event just about NFTs for the local artists, how to sell your yeah. art on NFTs and stuff like that. So yeah, crypto paradise as well. It's all still something I don't understand very well. So it'd be good to be around other people that uh, uh, know a lot more about that. Than you. That's how I'm learning. It's not like reading. You can learn some stuff. But when you are with the people doing this for a long time, and I, in yeah. Lisbon, in that we had them. Yeah, I learned, I learned by organizing events about crypto without knowing anything about crypto. So imagine uh -huh. I was mediating a panel for experts. And all my questions were very valid because I had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> you shouldn't be the smartest person in the room, right? You got to surround yourself no. with other people. Yeah, just asking questions that I really have. Okay, what the fuck is an NFT? I have no idea. <laughs> and the guys were saying, oh, it's these non-fungible use for this. Okay, how do I make money with that? Oh, you can make it by these, by doing this, by doing this. Okay, that's cool. And that's how I, I found about social painting. tokens and everything. There was a painting that sold for $69 million, something outrageous, by... Uh, What's his name? Yeah, but yeah, now. the whole art it's market crazy. is completely insane. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the next question for you, uh, and we're, we're almost at 30 minutes now, so I want to make this a bit faster. But now, so how do you encourage a healthy work-life balance as a digital nomad? I think it's really important and sorely lacking in a lot of cases. I think it's, again, go to communities because if you have 15 events a day, you will want to go to a lot of them every single day. So imagine we have CrossFit at 5 and mm -hmm. we have yoga at 7. You need to stop working because everybody, basically, I would say 90% of the people in Madeira stops working at 5 because at 5 all the events start. We don't yeah. organize events until 5 and then at 5. Uh, so everybody stops working. So there is no <laughs> there is no other way around. If you are there and you, keep, you have to keep working because you work for a big company, you will start to uh -huh. understand conversations that the others have a much better work-life balance because they were at the CrossFit and they went yoga and they went swimming and you were at the core space working. So the more you hang out in communities like this, you will understand that most people are optimizing for work-life balance and that it's completely okay to stop working at five. For sure. Sometimes you just have to turn your brain off and take a break for a while. You're not a, you're yeah, not just, a machine, right? <laughs> that's again, that's the power of the communities, right? When everybody around you, imagine you are, but then everybody around you stops working at five and goes to the beach. You're like, okay, why am I working 12 hours a day in this beautiful island? There is no reason for that. So you, no. you learn by imitating and that's it. That's it. So, if you have like an appointment at six, if you have a CrossFit class at five, if you have an event that you really want to go at seven, you will stop working and you will go. It's like a four stop. 
the issue is yeah. that well because we were working from home there is no first stop we just keep working well exactly. there's nothing else to do i'm tired of netflix so that was uh -huh. the big uh, misconception of people working from home during covid when you are in the community when you have the freedom to go out and go swim and go do stuff everything changes and life becomes much better yeah, for sure. That's one of the things that I'm, I'm missing here in Thailand. A lot of the gyms are closed, uh, you know, Ooh. pretty much just working from my Airbnb, uh, living with my girlfriend yeah. here. And there's not too many other places to go. But, yeah, you know, things will get better. I'm hopeful that things are going to get better very soon. It's almost six months. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows when it's going to be, but, yeah. So next, I'm going to ask you, what does your daily schedule consist of? I was watching another interview with you, and you said your life is boring in beautiful places. <laughs> so you, you work because a lot, I, right? Yeah, stuck, I work a lot. Mm -hmm. You work a lot, <laughs> so, obviously. Yeah. How do you so take I have break? a lot of things mm -hmm. going on. and mm -hmm. Wow. That's, well, I go to communities, to be honest. So when I'm in Madara, well, you have to go because at six, people are starting to drink in the bar or people want to go to CrossFit and stuff. So, but when I'm not in these communities, I work much. I was in Kapur, I was living in a beautiful hotel and I was working much more because there was no stop. There was like, we had a coworking space, but then we just work until eight or seven because that's when people will go to the beach bar. So my usually day is like almost nine to five. So I wake up, it depends on where I am. Right here in Valencia is I woke up, I usually start working around 8.30 when I'm not sick today, mm -hmm. I'm a little bit sick. Then I, now I'm here, I'm working until like 11, then I go to CrossFit at 12, and then I start, start working again, I have, lunch, I have lunch and everything. Start working around 3, 3.30, it's super hot here right now. So then I'll just okay. stop working like 6, 6.30 and go to the garden, go to the beach, something like that. So I, I'm, I'm pushing everything a little bit later because it's super hot and it's fun oh, how does to it be do outside. Now? For exactly. me, it's like, I think it's like 32 degrees right now, Ooh, that but is really it's uh, super humid. So it's the ah. one that you go out and you start sweating automatically. It's better to, just to stay in, in the air conditioning, relax. Work yeah, home. then at 6.30 you go out and you enjoy the rest of the day. And Spain is like that kind of lifestyle where people go out to dinner at 9, 9.30. So, mm -hmm. so from 8, everything is like everybody's on the side. So that's when you should go out. But it's completely different from my dad. I wake up at 6, uh, 6 30. I go to the gym at 7, and I come back. I start working at 9, and then I stop working at 4, 4 35. So it's very different from place to place. Mm -hmm. Would you say most of your most of your calls consist of like Zoom? Do you use Zoom a lot? Oh, yeah. No, I'm actually. The world? I'm have, yeah. I have some. Yeah, first, yes, of course. Um, my, most of my meetings happen on Zoom. But because I'm a remote work consultant, I also push things on a different way. So, so I avoid most calls. I have several rules. Imagine I receive daily 10, 10 minutes a day asking for calls that I refuse mostly because I don't have time first. But then because yeah, what I used to do in the beginning Busy. and I had time when I was starting, which is let's get to know people, let's have calls with everyone. I don't have time anymore. Even though I love these conversations, I don't have much time. I'm starting, I have very strong um policies to accept calls so first usually i send people to over email send me an email if it's we may probably we can fix it or solve it over email tell me what you want yeah oh i want to i want to see opportunities yeah send me an email uh so i push everything to email because on the email i have my virtual assistant working and she takes care of most of That's the email right. and then i i can only answer the new ones uh, the most important ones so i'm recalls and even refusing calls, I still have usually four a day. I'm also really um, lowering the number of calls. So that's my new goal is I want to have mm -hmm. more time for the work. So I'm kind that of makes perfect sense. Wrestling. I only, for example, I don't, I only have calls from Monday to Thursday and all from two to four, something and like that. The so rest only hours. Uh, yeah. So that's on purpose. Yeah. So I don't have to. I usually don't have calls in the morning. This is an exception. I usually don't have calls. I never have calls on Fridays, uh, so I can do whatever I want. I'm trying to implement a four-hour work week and work more mm. the other days. I basically use this also to test, but most of the times I have just very few time slots where people can book calls. 
it's interesting you meet meet the four hour work week. I actually met Tim Ferriss a few years ago in Austin. He lives in Austin. Wow. And just yeah, <laughs> it's a great guy and very humble, super smart, very humble. And uh, they have his book here at the Airbnb where we're staying, but it's in Thai, so I can't read it. <laughs> My Thai language skills are a big terrible. Fan. But, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan good. of Mr. Tim Ferriss. I still listen to his podcast. Uh -huh. because, like his podcast is the most knowledge about the whole different uh -huh. teams, like keto diet and everything in between. Because deep conversations and they really go sure. deep in the teams, like keto, like everything else. So it's still my favorite podcast until today. Yeah, I should not listen to his podcast too much, but I probably should. Should start listening to it more often. Listen to one, I yeah. and then and then you meet like really cool people. People. So, for example, my one of my world is Derek Sievers. There's all author, like he's a writer now. He was the founder of CD Baby that he sold, became a millionaire, and now he's a, like a slow man, yeah. and he's like one of the yeah. best writers I know. He writes things out of no. the like. So it takes. He says he's a slow thinker, and then he writes about things after really thinking about them. So for mm -hmm. me, the interview of Tim Ferriss. Is the Derek Sievers is the best ever. I hope to check that one so out. Just the way about the world, man. And check Derek Sievers, hell yeah or no. Just like a small short book of his manual to live, and it's so good. It's incredible. If you want to live outside the box that the society puts for you, these kind of books are so good. So um, I became a big fan of Derek Sievers because of Tim Ferriss. I became a big friend, a big fan of Noah Kagan from uh, uh, CLF oh, yeah. AppSumo yeah. because of He's Tim Ferry. So there's a whole... They're right in Austin, Austin, Texas. No, it has been really cool many years. I lived yeah. there for many years, probably friends. six or seven years, and I just decided, ah, this is so expensive to live here. It's getting overpopulated. Um, I want to see someplace oh, yeah. new. So I went to Bali, Indonesia, and then Thailand, <laughs> and then kind of got stuck here for about, you know, I've decided to stay here for the moment. Yeah. So, so basically, yeah, Tim Ferriss is my so hero. <laughs> yeah. If Tim Ferriss Very is good. watching us. Hey, Tim. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Have you considered just sending him an email? Have you ever sought to send him an email? No, it's very clear that he doesn't. It's like he doesn't. Actually, all some of these rules I created are inspired by his blog post. So it's very clear mm -hmm. that he doesn't read most of the emails. Like I don't. So I never send an email. If I if I really wanted to ask him a question, I would do it over Twitter because the platform yeah. checks a little bit more often. But yeah, no, it's like I'm just happy with the work he puts out there. It's enough mm -hmm. for me. And yeah. I'm afraid. Well you know when you have heroes and you meet your heroes and then they suck. You get really disappointed. It happened with me a couple of uh -huh. times. So I prefer him to be my hero and stay like this and don't ruin our beautiful relationship we have without knowing mm -hmm. each other. So. I'm sure he's probably already familiar with your work. Been featured in so many different publications <laughs> at this point. I mean maybe. <laughs> maybe. And and his his assistant is actually Portuguese as well, which also helps a lot. <laughs> oh really? Huh. Yeah. Interesting. I know a lot of stuff about Mr. Tim. <laughs> Of course, your wealth of knowledge. So, where can we find more information about you on social media? What's your website? Uh, those types of uh, things. That's a hard one. So, LinkedIn is the place I hang out the most, and I try yeah. to messages. The rest is completely a mess up everywhere, as you know, because I take forever to answer messages. So, what LinkedIn is the one I try to answer sometimes. Uh, so LinkedIn, Gonzalo Wall is the only guy. Also, is the place where I write more about what I think and what I see about the world. So if you want to get and read about remote work and my projects, everything will be on LinkedIn first and then spread for the other platforms. And then my podcast is Remote Work Movement. Uh, it's not about myself. I just interview the smartest people I find around and the people that inspired me to create what I create. So, for example, Aaron, who created Tulsa Remote, is there. Dave from David Forever. Abraham, the CEO of Outpost in Bali, uh, Nacho Rodriguez uh, from uh, Re People is there. So basically all the people that inspired me, I used to mm -hmm. see this podcast as an excuse to ask them questions for one hour so I can learn from them. And then people listen, but mostly I use it for myself. Uh, <laughs> so that's the, yeah, those two are looking for a job in Europe, remote Europe, but mostly mm -hmm. remote work movement and uh, LinkedIn. And if you want to know about Madara, just... Google Digital Nomads Madeira and our, our, our website will pop up. 
And if you want to try Africa, and if you are nomad from October, we'll be in Cap Verde. Just look remote work, Cap Verde, and something will pop up as well. Awesome. Well, I'm going to include a link to all of those in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube. And uh, it's great, great finally talk to you because I've been following you for a long time now. And uh, it's great to finally put a, to do an interview with you. It's true, so man. Thank up, you so much for the interview. Uh, for sure. Thanks. You too, man. You are a workaholic. I see you every single time <laughs> posting and commenting. I was like, come on, how this guy has so much time. Now I know you are in the lockdown in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, that's part of that's part of the reason. That's how I'm able to achieve so much. Now I'm working on the revenue piece of the equation. Man, uh, to be honest, one year and a half ago, I I started everything just to finish up. I started two years ago uh, the whole entrepreneurial journey with with my podcast, Remote Work Movement. And then mm-hmm. during COVID, I was doing something not healthy. I was working 16 hours a day. So if I was awake, I was working. And it, this lasted five months. And this is how I built everything. This is how I built in Portugal, yeah. remote Europe, the podcast. You got to put in the work. Podcast, the, everything was, yeah. It, I don't say anyone go do 16 hours a day. That's stupid. I will never, I hope never do it again. But at the same time, it allowed me to really push for a certain period of time. And then mm-hmm. during summer, I could relax a little bit because we could go out. But basically, I I just, I used lockdown and you are in lockdown now to just create a massive output, speaking everywhere, interviewing everyone. I was like doing four or five interviews a day, wow. podcasts, webinars. I launched my online course. I spent my day working I, that's how i got close and lost some years of life but at the same time that's how i created the business it's like it's no no yeah, no 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 i messed take, up right? i messed up mm-hmm. yeah but now i can work it's with that hard. healthy part <laughs> it's hard to turn it off sometimes right because like for me even when i'm in try you know enjoying myself or going on a motorbike adventure around chiang mai i'm still vlogging for my youtube channel so it's like i just take a break right you gotta yeah. remind yourself uh, but it's it's difficult sometimes. My, my girlfriend complains yeah. a lot, so we created we created rules for the cell phone as well. Because, mm-hmm. because she was saying, so well, I was on the good. cell phone working. Still doing stories. I was having. Phone down. Mm-hmm. It's true. And I was there with her. I was answering people. And I was having lunch with her. I was answering people, and like it was insane. So now I'm creating a lot of rules, basically to keep my mental health as well. Because then I struggled, of course. And after two years doing this without breaks, without vacations. This is also why I came to Valencia. Um, yeah. It's like you need you need to break. And, yeah, just and leave you need to break or you home. Break. Don't even bring it with you to dinner. Just leave it somewhere else. But yeah, then go to the beach. you feel like you're attached yeah. to the device, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's just for me, it's water. If I go to the ocean, there is no way I can take my phone to the ocean. So mm. when I'm on the ocean, it's like the best excuse to disconnect from everyone. Yeah, yeah. Great advice. All right. Man, thank you. Thanks, Gunhal. It's been an honor. It's an honor to be here, and congratulations for your work. All right. Please subscribe to the channel. It's been another episode of Digital Nomad Ventures. Today I've been uh, interviewing Gunhalo Hall. He's doing amazing work in Portugal with the Madeira Islands and creating a digital nomad village there. Uh, So, yeah. Thanks for watching. Talk soon.